Um, well, it's early, but in terms of the glue on this, hello, whoever you are, type a comment so I know who you are. Um, well, glue is, not glue, sorry, paint is dry. Let's flip the cameras and I can show you what's in front of me. So, if you now see the bits I didn't paint yesterday are now standing out quite well. And it's dried to quite a nice, quite a nice, oh, they dropped off quickly. I had five viewers. Hello, Steve Haywood. Um... Seems to be drying well. Uh, that's the one I had to put to one side because there's not as much room. These base bits are looking quite. The paints run a little bit there. Uh, and there you are. So, so, so far, not too bad. Um, may have a go at some level of um, assembling it all uh, this afternoon if only just to check how it all fits together do on this like working out where all the controls go and um, fitting the um, assembling things like the time rotor but uh, hello the one viewer whoever you are yeah, there's still quite a lot of bit of work to do on this, but having consulted the inst oh hello three of you, uh, hello Steve Hayward again. Um, oh, go on, I'm going to swap the cameras around and show you what I've done in the past few minutes. This is very basic. This is, but uh, so that's half of it, and that's the other half. It's still got to have controls inserted and also um, there is a whole thing in the instructions that I've got to do uh, I've got to get some glue out and attach a group of spurs to the top of that and then over that lay these foundation things that are underneath here if I take one of these off, you'll see that's a whole foundation thing. So that's got to go together. And yeah, there's a whole set of raised things that get it all up at a nice angle. And then that can go on top of the console. And then they tell you to assemble the time rotor next. I did message the guy because I thought I thought there was something missing from the box and then I realised the reason there isn't a top to this tube for the time rotor is because there's some sort of sticky back plastic um, stuff and that forms your top for your time rotor. Just assembling that is going to be um, quite fiddly. Uh, hello to the... Oh, I was about to say hello to the four of you. Hello to the four of you. Uh, this is a, a test assembly here. But like very, very basic. It still needs controls adding. It still needs getting up to uh, the correct angle. I've got to get some glue out the house. Sorry about this shaking stuff I am on my phone. I've got to get some glue out the house to uh, get it all together properly. But... Um, we're getting there. I'll I'll get the tripod for the camera set up again this afternoon and get the camera plugged into the mains again. And um, I'm not sure whether I'm painting more this afternoon or whether I'm going to start some level of assembly. I might start some level of assembly because, as I say with this. There's certain things I can do at the moment here without actually needing to paint. I can just sort of start gluing things together and um, work on that. But uh, hello to all. Oh, just about to say hello to the sixth person and they dropped off. 
but yeah that's how it's looking at the moment I've got an exciting bag of black things some of which are wonderful circle shapes so they obviously go here and I think they need um, as our American friends would call it decals adding there's a whole load of um, stickers in there so um, hopefully see some of you this afternoon uh, I'll be after lunch I'll uh, be at it with glue then I realized there was more I could do on this today than I thought so what I'm going to do is a bit of this uh, then hopefully I'll be able to glue other bits to this if it's fully dried and it should have dried this afternoon hello my one viewer I'm about to do some gluing on the base of the console bear with me I've got to affix this camera uh, how do I say that's flipped to get our saws an angle so we can see what I'm doing ah! damn thing thing hello Eric you rather loud language just because I'm trying to get this phone into a tripod and it's not playing ball so it's not just the getting it in a tripod it's the getting it in a tripod and then getting it angled Oh, for God's sake! That's falling out of the tripod. Now, there we are. This being Sunday lunchtime, I'm listening to just a minute. <laughs> Listen, I'm always very fair. The original. Yes. You can get a point for a couple of Oh, that's fine then, Nicholas. Uh, yes, you not the Gareth Ray One version. And, but you are not this is BBC Radio Four, don't so you? So you get a point for that. And you keep the subject, the Great Fire of London, and there are 51 seconds starting now. Good luck, Nish. Sadly, the rumour that a film was being made about the Great oh. Fire of London starring Vin Diesel as Dare move. Leaps and Daniel Day. Dare Lewis. move! Stay! How is he going to play the fire? The man is an absolute chameleon. Well, sadly, it's not funny me getting angry at this thing. Uh, really. Stay! <laughs> Fucking stay! I'm up against time here. Now. So, Josie, a correct challenge. 35 seconds available. The Great Fire of London starting now. Oh, my family came down to visit me in London. We were outside Buckingham Palace watching all the pomp and ceremony going on. My great nephew was on the shoulders of his dad, and I said, James, you enjoying this? He said, yes, but when are we going to go to Pudding Lane? Because although he's only five, he's got this obsession with the Great Fire of London. He's either going to become a historian or an arsonist. <laughs> we got off at Monument, where that great obelisky thing is, and there we saw where the great mm. fire. This glue takes ten minutes to dry. So you know what year it took place? You get to enjoy ten minutes worth of just a minute, aren't you, lucky? It's easy to remember, yes. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Right, Jenny, we'd like you to begin the next round. Oh, at the end of that round, uh, Jenny, Claire, and Josie have been the lead. The ladies are leading the men by mm. two points each. Uh, Jenny, my generation. Tell us something about my generation in this game starting now. 
I was born in 1960, so my generation is younger than the Who's, and I have no desire to die before I get old. In fact, with all the new drugs around, I'll probably live till 110 getting on everybody's nerves. Shall I tell you what sums up my generation? Stuff like the Bay City Rollers, flared trousers, so there's the cheese time. Spots, shirt, and when this blouses, shit's hello, Dean. Platform shoes, poodle perms, and David Bowie. When this hits 12.25, are we gluing those two together? In the meantime, you get to listen to just a minute, aren't you, Lucky? What a generation we have been. All these exciting stuffs that we have introduced to the world and enjoyed. And I'll tell you something. <laughs> You covered it all perfectly, but you did leave out Arthur Haynes and Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> they were sadly pre my generation, Nicholas. <laughs> it was the 60s when we became famous. Ah, <laughs> yes, ah. it was. Doesn't matter, Nish, you challenged first. I challenged slightly because I was genuinely getting frightened. <laughs> it was, I thought you were going to list everything that had ever happened in history. It was amazing. <laughs> that was my intention before you interrupted. No, no, she, she was wonderful. You know, all those things did occur. Yes, the in the was right. When she was wonderful. Um, well done. And the 40 right. seconds bring you. if you need it. My generation is right. starting now. My generation else on the may internet well can be see the such worst delights. generation of all time. All we do is sit around. Uh, oh. Oh. To all something. Oh. I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, you've got it with seven seconds it's ago, Josie. with another point, of course. My generation starting now. Oh, sorry, is it, it was Josie? No, no, wait a minute, John. Yes, it was oh, sorry, Josie, you sorry. challenge. You've got a correct challenge. I haven't pressed the buzzer yet. I mean, I haven't pressed the nipple. Oh. What? Really? <laughs> the nipple on the stopwatch. <laughs> Clement Freud. <laughs> Freud's grandfather is watching this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he's one. having a great time. <laughs> yeah. Seven seconds available. My generation, Josie, starting now. I still think of my generation really peaking in the 80s. And what I notice about my generation is that there were no... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking as a whistle went, gained that extra point. She's just ahead of Jenny Claire, and then one point behind her are Nish Kumar and Stephen Fry. Well, YouTube right, of glue. You to begin, yes. Stephen. Oh my. And oh, I haven't tried listen. live streaming on YouTube sure you yet. On it. Salvador Dali. Oh. Will you tell us something about that great painter in this game, starting now? Great Catalonia. I may Salvador nick these streams Dali, and put them on YouTube. 1906, or as close as makes no difference, he had an enormous reputation in the 1930s by joining the Surrealist movement, headed by André Breton, who fell out of favour with him, really, and he called him Avida Dollars, which is an anagram of his name because he disliked Dali's love of money. But his great achievements as a painter really cannot be denied. The persistence of memory, perhaps, Perhaps the most famous melting clocks in the distance and others being eaten by ants, hugely influenced by Henri Bergson, of course. Uh, <laughs> Josie Chance. To Andres, I'm afraid. No, that was an Henri. Oh, oh did Henri you talk to him? One French name is much like another. I'm so Henri sorry. Bergson, I'm Henri and Andre, I'm sorry, the, it's my tinnitus. Time and free will. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all now, you answered to the front. I really it enjoyed it, though. <laughs> I know, it was very, very interesting. And he's going to continue. And he's got another point, and Sorry, he's got the subject. You've got 23 seconds. Salvador Dali starting now. Swans reflected as elephants and vice versa. One of his greater paintings, too, a crucifixion, which no one can forget who has ever seen it. Immense energy and use of space. Very few had his realistic style as... Oh, Nish, you challenge. He knows too much, and this is unfair. <laughs> <laughs> He does know a lot, but then so do you. With the, it's a competition there, Nish. We enjoyed your comments, so we'll give you a bonus point for that. And, uh, but you get a point for being interrupted, Stephen. And there are still ten seconds available. Uh, Salvador Dali is starting now. After the war, he became something of a celebrity in America. He appeared on game shows. His moustaches were wonderfully famous, of course. Bigotes was his name for them. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Stephen, you do bring an erudition to the show, which is wonderful. <laughs> and you kept going to the whistle when again the next point. You're now equal in the lead with Josie Lawrence, and you're both two points ahead of Jenny Claire and Nish Kumar. And Josie, we're back yeah. with you to begin. A bitter pill. Mm. 60 seconds starting now. Well, a bitter pill is like when you get a part in a play and then suddenly it's taken away from you because Clarissa knows the producer. You realise you'll never have that leading role and it's a bitter pill to swallow. Let's not Four minutes to go and to whoever's just joined us, uh, but the real the bitter glue pills to both of these. And the first in four minutes' time, I'll be able to glue them together. Who used to coat the pill in? Oh, Jenny challenged me. Two coats. Yeah. Sugar, sugar. sugar coated was the first oh, one. Yes, I am, Craig. Oh, you think yeah. she'd played this game before? No. <laughs> and I had to listen like that. I got it was sugar coated. She said. Yeah. She she kind of yes. Mm. She mumbled slightly, yeah. but I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it was an incorrect challenge, my darling. Yes. So you've got a point. You've got another point, and you've got uh, 28 seconds if you need it. A bitter pill starting now. Why do pills taste bitter? Have you ever had a, an aspirin stuck on the back of your tongue? It's blimmin' awful, isn't it? My ma used to give me orange juice to swallow. Oh. Stephen Chan. Yeah, it was a oh. bitter pill to swallow earlier. Yeah, you're yes, quite right. Right. Yes, swallow. Yeah. Too much swallowing right. there. Orange juice just work. <laughs> so, Stephen, you've got in with... Uh, 16 seconds on a bitter pill starting now. Well, they told me you were dead, Heraclitus. They brought me bitter news to bear and bitter pills to shed, which isn't quite how the poem goes, but one of my favourites. Yes, life is filled with bitterness and a kind of astringent darkness which can occasionally disappoint, and yet often... <laughs> Stephen Pryor was then speaking as a whistle when gained that extra point and has increased his lead by one over Josie Lawrence, Nish Kumar and uh, Jenny Clay in that order. Uh, Nish, we're back with you to begin. It's uh, subject here, killing two birds with one stone. Did you talk about that subject in this game starting now? Killing two birds with one stone is surprisingly difficult. There's a very specific technique uh, to two it. Minutes a lot of people might assume that you should stand one bird in front of the other. However, it is preferential to go for what 10-pin bowling enthusiasts call a 7-10 split. <laughs> Having the birds stand next to each other, throwing the stone... Uh, uh, Stephen there Chan. was two others there was next to each other oh, and yeah. one in front of the other. So yeah, I, was, right. yeah. I feel <laughs> cruel because that was a good... Call, and I've got nothing to say on the <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good. Let's oh, yes. from you then. Uh, 38 seconds. You've got killing two birds with one stone, mm. Stephen, starting mm. now. By telling you what an arid, sterile, and frankly uninteresting subject this is, and yet talking about it, I'm killing two birds with one stone because I'm getting the subject out and I hope extending time. Um, Nish Challenge. Was there a repetition of subject? There was a repetition oh, yes, of subject. You were absolutely spot well, on. Well, <laughs> So you've got it back with another Oh, do of hurry up, young man. Available, killing two birds with one stone. Only a minute to do. Now. Stone choice is an incredibly important part of killing two birds with one stone. The temptation would be to go for a heavy boulder. However, a light, thin pebble is preferential. <laughs> Stephen challenge. I, I was going to challenge preferential earlier for being the wrong word when yeah. you meant preferable, but... Yeah. Um... <laughs> Nonetheless, it is a repetition of that uh, odd, <laughs> oddly selected word. I, I got so excited I that I had a correct challenge that it went to my head. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, sorry, it's shameful. But you have got a correct challenge. <laughs> oh, uh, and you've got 14 seconds. You tell us something more about killing two birds with one stone starting now. It's cruel and unpleasant to kill any bird, you might think. On the other hand, I have to confess to being a bit of a hypocrite. I eat chicken. Therefore, I am responsible for the killing of birds. I can't deny it. More than... Uh, Two, I suspect, oh. really, lots of them. Well, before the whistle went, Jenny, oh, yes. and there time. was a dreadful uh. Yeah. And another one. Yeah. Not a it's repetition. One, it not repetition. Yes. I mean, the other one hesitation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't was hesitating so much as using the word "er." <laughs> <laughs> it, it kind of gives balance and rhythm uh, to a sentence, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it 
Alex has a... He listened to Churchill, though. He never hesitates. He was... He says... Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's just... Uh, Miss Stephen, you're absolutely right, but you can't do it in just a minute. No, thank you. <laughs> so, Jenny, you're correct. He did say, uh, and you've got half a second to go. Killing two birds with one stone, starting now. I was accidentally... <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny Clare was speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point. She's moved forward. She's still in fourth place with Nish Kumar. Uh, no, third place because just one ahead is Josie Lawrence and another cup ahead of Stephen Fry. And Jenny, it's your turn to begin. A holiday in Wales. Strange subject, but uh, not a strange subject. Wales is lovely and I love going there. Gosh, you've got to be so careful in this show, haven't you? Um, <laughs> Oh, I love Wales. I really do. I love the people. I love the way they speak. It's so sexy. I used to have a lot of Welsh girls friends. It was the voice that Crazy got me. Soul. Oh, you know, it's a very sexy way of speaking, isn't it? Are you oh, talking you just a minute? Here, right? I get on with the show. <laughs> a holiday in Wales, Jenny. 60 seconds as starting now. Uh, well, this um, is very personal. Oh, this is the base, I'm Jason. about Hang to on. go uh, on holiday to Wales with my family. I'm I am so excited because it's such a... Stephen Shand. Just because it's the... Oh, yeah. This oh. is that bit there. I'm going to lovely oh. Wales. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, Stephen, you've got in another point, of course. Picture Hello, Nicky. A holiday in Wales is not enough. Welcome to live gluing. You've missed the exciting bit. And she replied, I don't know, my love. Have you any ideas? He said, well, there's a dolphin. Possibly we could go in. What about Wales? Probably going to end this stream in about... In uh, uh, chance. Breakfast Three minutes holiday? time when just a minute is. Oh, we're going to leave the then. Words in the oh. the just happy to be involved, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you are involved. You're very, very, you're very good. You're they may or may not place. set over lunch. It would be nice if they set over lunch because then it would give me this surface here. <laughs> So I need that challenge. There. So, Stephen, another point to you. 35 seconds, a holiday in Wales starting now. I do a memory of somewhere called Caswell yeah. Bay. Right. Right. Ice creams came into it in a motorboat. I was invited to go... Having the box the this bag, as a sort of passenger, and the next thing to be applied are these. Hard. The water was I have to put a set like of those concrete. all around. Feeling, really, isn't it? Oh. Fluid. Um... Jenny, you've changed. Oh, I just think we have to be careful. He yeah, said spanked. put a set of those all around on oh, each one of those. Deviating from the nice, clean family And if family I can get those glued show, into place today, this has always been it'll probably be next us. weekend or maybe if in the week. In you come down I then have these. The these that is spanky. Yeah. these so, uh, then have to go on top so. of those. That's fair enough. And that provides you with a I sort of slope it. down. 17 seconds or so on which Stephen. you can put the actual... One of my console panels, which I showed on the Christmas previous stream, Wales, which you can find if you look on my profile. Yes, but somehow more than that, it has a quality of charm and coziness and beauty that we associate with an infant's Xmas, if you want to call it that. Something immemorial. <laughs> right! So at the end of that round, Stephen Fry with extra points for speaking as a Wesleyan and being interrupted has increased his lead at the end of the round, all the other three, because they're almost equal in second place. And Stephen, this is going to be the final round. Oh, oh let me give this situation as we go into the final round. Right. Well, um, Nish, who's only never played a game before, he's equal with Jenny Eclair in third place, but only one point ahead is Josie Lons. And a few points ahead of her is Stephen Fry. And Stephen, we're back with you to begin. Uh, the subject now is earplugs. Good Lord. Could you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? Well, these can be wax or silicon and are thrust into the lug holes in order to defend you against some unwelcome noise. It can be gunshots, or in my case, it could be snoring, of course. Yes, oh, it can be. It can um, be. It can be. Challenge. No, good yeah. point. A repetition. Yeah. Can be, can be. Josie, you've got in with 49 seconds if you wanted on earplugs starting now. I always find those wax earplugs that are meant to help you when you go for a swim are dreadful because water always collects behind them and makes it much worse. You must never, ever mistake earplugs for ear pugs. Those tiny dogs that live in your offices. They're dreadful creatures. Ah. Uh, Genuine. Some dreadfuls. Yes. Oh. Yes. Ooh. 
Mm-hmm. So, Jenny, you got in on the last round too, which is good. 28 seconds available. Earplugs is not enough. Earplugs are really important if you happen to be staying in a hotel where a young couple are having very noisy sex in the room next door. It is disgraceful. So, the only other option, if you are sans earplugs, is to turn up the Antiques Roadshow. That'll teach them. And go for a long walk until they have exhausted themselves. Can you tell? that this is from personal experience. I actually... So, Ginny Clare was then speaking as the whistle when gained the next point. And the final situation is that Nish Kumar, who's not played the game before, but he finished up in a very fine fourth place. I say very fine, because he was only one point behind Jenny Eclair, who's played it a number of times, and she was only one point behind Josie Lawrence, who's only played it a number of times, but there were a few points behind Stephen Fry, who has played it a few times, and so we say, Stephen, you are the winner this week. So, then you me to say thank you to these four or five players of the game, Stephen Fry, Josie Lawrence, Nish Kumar, and Jenny Eclair. I think uh, Hayley Sterling, who's helped me with the score, and she's blown her whistle with such delicacy when 60 seconds elapsed. We're grateful to our producer, Victoria Lloyd. We're indebted to Ian Messiter, who created this amazing game. And we're very indebted to this lovely audience here in the Radio Theatre. They've cheered us on our way, magnificently. From them, from me, Nicholas Parsons, and the team, goodbye. Thank you, and tune in again the same time when we play Just a Minute! <laughs> Stop then. What if I do that? No, no, no. Live iPad arguing. Gatineau police say they're investigating the fire as suspicious due to signs of a break and enter. No one was injured. City documents suggest the building was worth at least one point five million dollars. Canada. Maple syrup producers are springing into this year's season with high hopes. The warm days and cold nights are exactly what's needed for sap to flow. Scott Dugo is a fifth generation syrup producer at Fulton Sugar Bush in Pakenham. He says so far the season is looking good. That snowfall, the uh, snowfalls that we got earlier uh, and the cool weather that we got was ideal to help keep our bush nice and cool and, and that's just what we need. Also the forecast uh, for the next couple of weeks is ideal. Producers say a gradual spring is key to a good season. And a tourist attraction in Brockville originally set to... As I said, live iPad argument. Um, so, I just flip stuff around on this. Um, Um, in fact, at least one of you is watching a video. When I said I'd be live on the internet this afternoon, it's a naughty person. Um, it's time to do a bit more gluing. I have a yeah. I have a diagram nearby to tell me which way. These have to be glued along there to attach to there so we will create a series of six spurs sticking out from the console and um, hello two viewers not hello three hello three about to start more gluing I've got to glue this there 
and that there and that will create six spurs uh, spread out across that base area and then I'll leave you for the afternoon and go off and watch an X-Files movie. Hello Alan. More gluing. About to put some glue on this. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to glue this into position and so if you'll bear with me I will have to attach this camera so we get an angle looking down. Craig, uh, so yeah, about to put some glue on. I keep having to look at the diagram. About to put some glue on uh, this bit and this bit. And where were we? Oh, yes, entertainment. We have a TARDIS shaped speaker, which you may have caught a glimpse of earlier. We have a CD player. And we have a behind the scenes of Jago and Lightfoot CD. Which will keep us entertained while we wait for glue to dry. Right, there we are. Just trying to find this live stream on my iPad. Hello. God, it's about a 10 second delay, but I can now see what I'm filming. So, glue. Just seen it freeze. Well, it should still be alright. Glue. Got a clock in front of me. I think we'll work on this first. Why can I not hear this Ampress play this well? Of course, my creaky CD player just would decide to um, play up. Oh, come on. is failing as well, that doesn't help. Ah. 
Hello, my name is Lisa Bowerman and I direct the uh, Jago and Lightfoot audios as well as playing Ellie. I doubt there'll be more than a dozen of us on the cruise. Ah, no hoi polloi. A chance to enjoy some decent company for a change. Oh, you think stuck up? Oh, pleasant company accepted, of course. Oh, oh, of course. In this particular series, we're out at sea, literally, and uh, I think Jago and Lightfoot are still trying to find their uh, bearings for most of it. It's a bit like, I suppose you could say, the Victorian version of Lost. You never quite know what's going on. To put it all in one particular boat with a the same sort of passengers I think is brilliant because uh, when you close down the environment of a drama I think it always works really well for danger and adventure. My name's Justin Richards and I'm the script editor for Jago and Lightfoot and this series I've written two of the episodes. This series is Jago and Lightfoot on a cruise. Jago and Lightfoot rounds the world in fact although they end up in, uh, in a variety of locations they don't get too far. I think Monte Carlo is the furthest they go and an, and an unnamed island. So yes, it's nice to, to get out of yeah, London, really. but it's not something we want to do too often because London is very much part of the Jago and Lightfoot landscape. So we, we start in London and we return to London. But, uh, but it's nice to get out and about and get some, some fresh sea air in the middle. Gentlemen, if you'd care to ascend the gangplank. Of course. Yes. Yes. Goodbye, dry land. Hello, sailor. I'm not sure where the idea came from. I think it just sort of cropped up at the end of the writing process for the previous series, which was the last two series since they'd been on the run and, and sort of rehabilitated. It felt slightly sort of claustrophobic and constrained just in terms of the locations, I think. So it was just a way of thinking about how we could open it out, do something a little bit different Ooh, right. and, um, and let them spread their, their nautical wings a little bit. So the best when I play Professor George Lightfoot. Christopher Benjamin, I play Henry Gordon Jago. After all that sea mist, a little bit of sunshine is the least we deserve. Don't you agree, Mr. Jago? What? Oh, yes. Give us a so, chance to finally take stock and put our so, troubles so, behind us. Oh, you had to say it, didn't you, Henry? What? I really should oh, have yeah. a word with you about so, tempting so, fate. So, 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 so. People have changed by sea voyages, this is I'm always told. I've never done a long sea voyage. And, uh, but I'm told that people are very changed. And you do meet, as with our relationship with Isabel Danvers, later Danvers, you do make, make oh, friendships and relationships which you wouldn't normally make on land. And so you go into a slightly different dimension. And it's freer and a little bit wilder. Guten Tag! We are Herr Jäger und Professor Lichtfuss. We wish you willkommen in the name of the Prussian Empire. On behalf of His Imperial Highness, King Wilhelm the Schreiter. We wonder if you could help us escape this dreaded fog, yeah? My word, they're Prussians. Prussian versions of you and me. Identical in every detail, except with much larger moustaches. <laughs> so they're from a world with a different history, you think? One in which the Prussian Empire endured. Yeah. Hello there! For goodness sake, Professor, don't wave back. Why ever not? There's no harm to be friendly. When we have to be uh, French and German and Italian parts of our characters, it's been very funny, hasn't it? Yes, it has. I'm very and very confusing. Quite, quite, quite an ordeal, really. <laughs> when we were switching very quickly from being a French German light, a French light foot to an English light foot and then back to a French one. And having conversations with ourselves. Yes, that's right. But the whole thing, I mean, this, what is this, series something or other? Nine. It's been back to front because this is the first episode and this is the last one we're doing. Yes. So it's all quite um, confusing, I think. Yes, we, you have to have a very good mental grasp of all the scripts mm. before you start on one. Yeah. Because of the method in which we record, you sometimes dive into another script to get passages from there. Mm. And so you have to know, otherwise, you know, you'd be in the wrong mood at the time of you know, the scene you're playing. I have to get the right atmosphere for each one. Hi, I'm Jonathan Norris and I wrote uh, Jago and Lightfoot, The Flying Frenchman. If you'll excuse us, we need to unpack. Of course. Might we share a table later at dinner? We would be honoured. Until then, then. <laughs> yes, until then, then. Well, I was given a, a list of all the characters, so you need to sort of give them a scene or some way of establishing them very 
quickly, which is why the, the first ten minutes of this is basically sort of a sort of P.G. Woodhouse comedy of um, Isabel Danvers um, flirtation, flirting with our heroes, just as a way of getting into the story sort of nicely and lightly and, and introducing the whole cast and the situation before the story itself begins. But the story itself is also setting things up for the series. Quite extraordinary. Any theories, Professor? Presumably, so the mist is acting as some sort of barrier. Heading towards... And no matter how far in you go, six of the instructions, you can never reach the other side. You're right. Mm, must have rode for half a dozen miles or more. So that's where but we're we going to get didn't to. didn't seem to be moving at all. Uh, but the today. most curious thing is the time discrepancy. It seems that time itself passes at a different rate inside the fog. Wherever we are, it's somewhere the normal progression of minutes, hours, days, no longer applies. The inspiration was that Justin gave me the title, The Flying Frenchman, which I don't think he meant seriously. I think it was just a placeholder. So I was thinking, OK, how could I have a situation where you have the idea of parallel universes or um, sort of mirrors of the boat but all different nationalities. And that was the sort of, that was the, the key scene for me, this mental image of all these different boats dotted around the horizon, all with different versions of Jago and Lightfoot, with different accents and different nationalities on board. I thought that was just strange and novel and, and that helped me create the story. That was the, the story is leading up to that and leading away from that. So that was the key moment. Oh, my prophetic soul. Look. What? Oh, my word! It's vanishing, melting away into the mist. Extraordinary. <laughs> I'm reading lots of Christopher Priest, and he does um, these strange sort of dreamlike stories where the edges of reality become blurred, particularly a sort of stories about something called the Dream Archipelago. And it was my, my idea of going, OK, what would Christopher oh, Priest write hello again, a Gary. story? And it has nothing to do with any of his books, any of his stories. But it's just me going, okay, I would just want that sort of the blurry edges of you don't quite know what's real and it doesn't actually quite make sense in a way. But that's what kind of what I'm aiming for. It seems to be some sort of seaside resort. And quite a grand one, too. I know where we are. I've been here before. Then where are we? That, my dear sirs, is Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo! <laughs> Episode two, we had in the writer's guide, I've got four lines describing a, a trip to Monte Carlo, so there'd have to be something in, to do with the casino. And, uh, and I quite fancied uh, in the mix having something that was to do with black magic or the occult within that sort of sophisticated environment. And we had a writer lined up who'd actually been to Monte Carlo, so knew all about it. And then he got, uh, got pulled off to do, to do something else. So. We could have briefed someone else, but it seemed easiest, given I'd got some ideas of the sort of story I was after and happened to have some time to, to write it myself. So that's what we did. And it did turn out to be great fun, I think. It, uh, it was nice writing an episode that wasn't either the first or the last, which I think all the Jacob and Lightfoots I've done within the series have been either the first episode setting things up or the last episode tying things together. So it was nice to do one that wasn't too constrained really by by any of the other episodes or anything else that's that's going on. They uh, they turn up on the boat and they, they have fun, if that's the right word, in Monte Carlo, and then they go off again. Hi, I'm Paul Morris, and I'm the co-writer of Jago and Life at the Island of Death. Everybody ready? By my reckoning, dusk won't be for another nine well, hours. So we've got plenty of time to explore. Four minutes away from me. Uh, a bit like the last time we wrote, we had quite an open brief for this story. It was the third of... Jake and Lifer's adventures on their sea cruise. Don't think there was anything we were asked to fit in apart from just to lead into the exciting finale. So we decided to take Jake and Life a bit further afield. I think we, we were aware that their first two adventures were going to be fairly, relatively close to home. So we thought we'd take them out into the unknown. We came up with two different ideas. The first was about a mining company on an uncharted island. And it would have turned out that the entire island was one vast creature, and that uh, <laughs> the creature was infested by smaller creatures which were akin to giant lice. Part of that idea ended up in the finished story. That the second idea was um, something rather more ethereal about the Greek island of the dead. And in that story, Lady Danvers was possessed by a, 
an ancient Greek demigod. So as, as you can probably tell from having listened to the finished thing, we eventually combined ideas from both of those. Oh, how absolutely charming. Uh, Lady Danvers, have you found something? There's a sort of mosaic on the floor here. It's really quite attractive, don't you think? In a primitive sort of way. Ah, yes. Fascinating. Actually, these tiles would look rather good in the orangery. I wonder, do any of you gentlemen have a handkerchief? Here, madam, take mine. Thank you, Mr Tibbs. Now, if I can just wipe away some of this muckiness, then we can get a closer... Ah! Ah! <laughs> madam! Mommy, she spark out. In the initial briefing, uh, there was a vast list of, of fellow passengers on the uh, on the ship that we were allowed to pick and choose from, and we didn't know which uh, which of those cast you know, other writers might go for. So we chose Lady Danvers. Wrote a, a sort of rather peculiar romance between Lady Danvers and um, Jago, which I gather may have been echoed in one of the other stories. I'm looking forward to hearing that to, to see if it all fits together. The big choice for episode four was really whether to resolve matters in the environment of the cruise on the boat with just those characters or to bring Jago and Lightfoot home before a final sort of scene at the end. And it seemed to me that, that London is their home ground. It's, it's the place they know best. And if they're confronting the hideous beast that's been, although they don't know it, um, uh, trailing them for the whole cruise, then, then London is the best place to do it. It opens it out a bit as well. We could have stayed on the boat, but that's, that's too confined to tell a, a complete story unless you open it out like like johnny did in the first episode or we could have gone somewhere else but it's nicer in a sense to bring it back there's a lot to resolve and if you're in an environment already known and understood by the people listening then that uh, then that helps they are so at home in london it's nice to send them off on holiday but we really do need to to end up back on their home territory and it seems only right that that's uh, that's where they would defeat the uh, the threat that menaces them throughout this series back not just in London but uh, but back at the Red Tavern with Ellie and Quick helping as of course they always do. I am Conrad Asquith and I play Inspector Quick. I'll be prudent to have a gander through the window before we go charging in. Good idea. What can you see? Oh, we're not oh, going in through the main door that's for sure. Why ever not? Because it's barricaded with tables oh, and chairs. Sure There's your fellow with a shotgun like and a nervous that chap that with him. That's what we all bring. Anyone else? No, I reckon they've all scarpered. Oh, wait, there is someone. That's not good. That's not good. Okay. What can you see? They got Miss Higson in there. Brewing time. Then we need to find another way in. Well, he has been promoted, which is quite unexpected. I didn't expect to be promoted to sergeant. To be promoted from sergeant to inspector in a fairly short time as um, quite uh, startling, really. One wonders what might come next, but I sort of rather feel that he's reached his career expectation. The problem with sending Jago and Lightfoot on a cruise is that we couldn't have a cruise where they were the only passengers. It would have taken a bit of explaining. And, uh, and so we need a, a relatively large cast of people who can get involved up to a point in the adventures, of course, but, uh, but you're always gonna have more people than we normally would in every episode to keep it plausible, which is a, a bit of a logistical nightmare, which, which Lisa's coping with very well. So we have different, different people doubling up as different uh, passengers and here on different days. So uh, more than usually, we've got uh, scenes from one episode being recorded with another and so on. Odd speeches being dropped in here and there. But it, uh, it seems to be coming together very well, like a, like a well-planned jigsaw, if there is such a thing. Most years, you say, now look, there's only a certain amount of cast you can have in Jago and Lightfoot, and every author we've had just about comes up with a, with a cast of about 90. So what I've done is, uh, in this particular situation, is that you oh, get actors who can do lots of voices, basically. I've divvied up a lot of the parts between people who aren't necessarily in the same episode, but also, I have to say, because the actors I've been lucky enough to get, you might not necessarily know that they're in the same episode as themselves and I think that that's the great thing about um, voice acting. When you, when you get really good audio actors, they can create 
any character you throw at them. And uh, we, we have ship's captains, an American couple who've just got married. When we're in um, Monte Carlo, of course, we've got all the people at the casino. We have some diabolical, evil kind of characters in that. There's also the jungle one, where we, uh, we, we seem to be quite international, actually. actually. Or, or should I say more European in this one? We've had every accent known to man, but with the predominance of a lot of French accents. It was quite fortuitous because I was going to cast somebody as the big game hunter, and uh, unfortunately the action question uh, wasn't available. I happened to be watching television on a Sunday and uh, seeing Mr. Selfridge, and there was uh, an actor very well known to Big Finish, Mr. Anthony Howe, doing the most spectacularly good French accent, and saw the penny dropped. I thought, oh, yes, excellent, and luckily he was free, so I was very happy about that. And my French is lousy, so I have to kind of rely on other people who, uh, who know what they're doing, and they all seem to, so that, that was very impressive. Hi, I'm Anthony Howe, and I play Victor Bataille. Nobody has worshipped here for many centuries, though the local people still regard this as a holy place. Mm. The chaps you were telling us about before. Uh, oui, les sauvages. They live out there in the jungle. Hence the high fences. Purely to keep them out. Exactement. The locals and the monsters. I've really enjoyed it, and actually I really, really enjoyed the script. I like the energy of it and the and then the characters. I think Jago and Lightfoot are great characters and, and the other characters in it are great as well. And and the actors that are playing the, these characters are, are brilliant. So yeah, it's great. It's Jago. Your friend, he does not look very happy. Would you? They're going to sacrifice him. The barbarians. Mr. Bataille, okay. I must leave it to you to stop the drilling. Where are you going? To it's save to Henry! Well. My first ever job was in French. It was working with a, a French-Canadian director called Robert Lepage. And uh, I was very lucky to go on a world tour with him. And all of the shows in French. And we rehearsed in Quebec, uh, in French Canada, French-speaking Canada. I did French at school, but I'm not fluent. But yes, I'm, I'm half fluent in French, I suppose. <laughs> Regardez, madame et messieurs, le forêt. What did he say? The drill. Oh, the drill. Oh, yes. Bravo. What a whopper. I did Possibly work with Benjamin's daughter, Amelia, who is a musician and was one of the musicians oh, in a Heather. play called Anne Boleyn that I did at the Globe with Miranda Raisin. Mm -hmm. Small world. Actors are very lucky in that when you love what you're oh, doing, it doesn't girl. feel like work. And this is a classic we example of, of coming to work and started just feeling like you're playing place the pieces and eventually it's, you know, it's, it's lovely it to be like this to, to work here. with such lovely people. Two of the characters also of them are, I weren't to taking very well, so I'm having to wait another 10 There's minutes. There's a little bit of Conan Doyle going on here as well, which I think uh, actually works rather nicely with a couple of series previously. And they create a miasma that keeps cropping up. It's the, the fog and lost at the same time. And strange things happen in the fog. And as ever, Jago and Lightfoot use their infernal investigations to uh, sort everything out. <laughs> David Warren, I'm playing Betterman Professor. Luckily, you spotted it, Lightfoot. What is it? A balustrade from the roof, by the look of it. I felt something on my head. Thought it was rain, but it must have been stone dust as the thing fell. Thank heavens you did. Indeed. Something of a narrow escape, if I may say so. I say, Professor, you all right? We heard the commotion. What happened? Just an accident, nothing to worry about. I'm sorry, this is Dr. Betterman. Betterman, my friend, Mr. Jago. Uh, how do you do? Hello. Well, I wanted to work with Christopher and Trevor ever since I heard they were working for Big Finish, but I didn't lobby too hard or strongly. I'm very discreet about that. So I'm really thrilled that I'm just part of one of their episodes. And they're just delightful. They're wonderful. They're old pros, but they are so funny. And without going into too much detail, they care for each other. I can tell that as people. I don't know how long they've known each other. I don't know if they knew each other before recording with Jago and Lightfoot. But they're just charming and lovely and very funny. That's why there are no signs of injury on the bodies. I fill you with head, remember, Betterman? They died of fright, oh. scared to death by this ceremony of yours. Some take a bit more convincing than others, but they all get taken in. Think the devil's come for their soul, then the old ticker gives out. And you take them down the tunnel and throw them off the cliff. That's about the size of it. It's all just a theatre show, but a deadly one. Don't be so sure. I could see how Jago fit into the Monte Carlo environment and he'd, he'd get enthusiastic about gambling and, and probably not be terribly good at it, though he might have a bit of luck. Lightfoot didn't seem to fit, so it was, it was a nice idea to give him 
someone that he could he could team up with and I wanted to be someone on a similar sort of academic and intellectual level as Lightfoot which is how Betterman came about the the other thing I wanted to do was was have it slowly appear that Lightfoot has teamed up with the villain and then I thought it would be a nice twist if not only is he not the villain but he thinks Lightfoot's the villain and so we have a, a confrontation and a showdown where they they each accuse the other and and they're both wrong of course and it, it worked very well and um, the relationship between the two means that Betterman's character can be developed a little bit more than is often the case with a, a character who's just there as a, as a foil for the plot if you like so it was great that we could get a, an actor of the caliber of David Warner to come in and, and play the role which he did perfectly of course he's got that uh, uh, that gravitas and uh, is a nice contrast as well as being complementary to to the lightful characters played by Trevor. So much so that we decided pretty much as soon as we cast David and before we even recorded it that uh, the Betterman will return in some form in the next series. So uh, so I'm looking forward to getting him back. Well, We've been trying to find something three, for David in Jago uh, and Lightfoot for two, absolutely 30, ages seven, because he, he's the kind of actor who you would automatically serious, would think would fit brilliantly three, into this sort of series. Yeah, but it was just a case of finding the right character. I know you've all listened to it now and I think the assumption is with a lot of listeners, oh he'll be playing the villain, but not necessarily. And what I love is the chemistry he had between um, him, him and uh, Tre he and Trevor have a lot to do together, and uh, the dynamic between those two also uh, investigating as well. I thought was a very, very interesting, and um, it'd be nice to think that we could, we could use that dynamic again at some point or another. But I thought I really, I really liked the three of them working together. I thought I thought that was terrific. I am Miranda Raisin, and I'm playing Mademoiselle Diabolique. <laughs> Henry, you have won! <laughs> I can't quite believe it myself. Your luck is really in tonight, Mr. Jago. It is rare that a player achieves a perfect score at the dark casino's blackjack table. An achievement très extraordinaire. <laughs> a player très extraordinaire, how I say so myself. You know what this means? It means I can progress to the next game. And the next game is the Devil's Roulette. Oh, I say. Well done. The Devil's Roulette. Oh, I can't wait to play that. If my luck holds, then... Uh, what was it you said? More wealth than I can imagine? Much more. There's a sort of a bit of a reveal with Diabolique. So it's, um, you know, she's to all intents and purposes a French sort of madame type figure. And I think you can be quite sort of brave with it. And so she's definitely somebody who likes to lure the men in and has a certain charm, but can equally well switch the charm off and turn it to steel. Sorry to say that you're not getting the best effect from up here. But I think we can see what's happening. You lit that limelight across the gallery. That's why you came up here. Well, you're not all mugs, then. That's right. And the light shines through a glass slide. And projects an image onto the smoke. Very convincing it is, too. I was looking, uh, initially, as ever, f for actresses who could do a uh, French accent. And her French accent is absolutely... In fact, it's almost too good, because she's meant to be playing a cockney, playing a you know, kind of outrageously French accent. But she was spot on and such a, a lovely person to have around as well. She was fantastic. And we're all thrilled. And the transformation from the, the, the French sort of siren to the gorblimey cockney was fantastic. She even said, now are we talking modern cockney or old cockney? I thought, oh, that's impressive. <laughs> no, she was brilliant. I'm absolutely delighted with the cast. Ah, top of the page. Thank you, Chris. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, yes, I'm as jolly as they come. Henry Gordon Jago, at your service. <laughs> I am Mademoiselle Diabolique. Delighted. Yes, until we meet again, Monsieur Jago. <laughs> I shall be counting the moments. <laughs> <laughs> and what? What? Oh, oh you. What she was? Was she all right? See you, Sir Bell. I should say so. <laughs> two minutes to go, and then I'll be able to apply those Since last little, two I've always loved sort of doing voices and, and probably and, end and broadcasting about them as well. And, things. and I think it's, as a child, it's an important way of exploring your imagination and, and being able to be things that you aren't, or that, you know, you can maybe access different parts of your character, or it's quite freeing sometimes to, you know, you can be braver. I mean, you hear it all the time. People will make a joke or say something that they wouldn't say in their own accent, but they'll stick on a, you know, strong Mancunian and say something they'd never feel I could get away with. And I think as an actor, it's just so important to have, a bit like a musician, it's like your scales. You have to keep in tune with 
all your, your various registers, your various, and, and also to sort of perfect things and be able to really inhabit them as opposed to just doing a voice, you know? It's fabulous. Clear blue skies at last. I thought it would never end. Our honeymoon never will end, Josh. Yeah, Mrs. Penfold is sort of spoilt southern bell gone with the wind type and uh, you know just loves her husband and can't really see beyond that i don't think she has many brain cells to rub together briefly i went to school in florida when i was sort of six i spoke in american accent while i was there just to sort of you know which was which wasn't long but then when i came back i went to an american school for a bit in london and also did an american accent much to my mother's horror but you know all my class were all american bankers kids and i just sort of it was much more fun. <laughs> what are you muttering about? Oh, nothing, nothing. I was just saying how convincing all this is. Yes, I think you're right. It would take in anyone. Even the most sensible and down-to-earth of people. Everyone, in fact. <laughs> it's a real it's privilege to work thoughts. with people who've sort of been there, done that, but don't act like they've been there, done that. You know, there's something ah, about no. actors um, who've done a great deal. They seem especially, more than people who might do other jobs, to have a, a still a well, great stuff, curiosity. I mean, sometimes one of the... One of the things, I mean, especially like my experience today, you almost want people to talk more about their experiences, but they're so keenly asking things, asking you questions, because it's that curiosity about life that I suppose makes them great actors, and also to have the sort of minds and sprightliness of 25-year-olds when they're very politely not 25. <laughs> it almost very good, especially as one's older now, because yes. they, you know, you meet people who are younger and still absolutely in the thick of the swim. Well, we never meet anybody older, do we? No, but that would be very hard. They would have no, to search no. very hard indeed and almost have a seance. Yes. Mm. I mean, I, I, oh, well. <laughs> I, I, just, I just remember. What was the name of the girl we'd just been acting with? No, I didn't know. <laughs> Sarah Bardell. Sarah, oh, that's Sarah right. Well, I worked with Sarah in 1963. She came down to Bristol. She was this little girl, and she just on her first job. It's wonderful because I had seen her father do Romeo three times as, as standing because I was in love with Claire Bloom, you know. In, mm. When I started at Rada, and I stood three times at the Old Vic and saw her father, who was a fabulous actor, really was, and Sarah's lovely, fabulous actress too. I'm Sarah Bedell, and I play Lady Isabel Danvers, a sort of adventurous, a widowed lady with an eye to the main chance and certainly an eye for the gentleman. Hello, Mrs. Uh... Lady Isabel Danvers. Delighted to make your acquaintance. I am... Professor Lightfoot. You've heard of me? No. I heard you telling... Ah, yes, of course. Uh, so, um, excuse the dodgy Mr. angle. Uh, so that's pretty much done. Enchanted and, and well, oh, my dear man, you are the next thing to stick together, I'll show you briefly. Lord Danvers company on this voyage? No, that's not. My husband has passed on. I'm very really sorry to hear that. It was many years ago, and Lord Danvers was a cold man. So cold, it took the servant several minutes to realise he was actually dead, not just having one of his moods. Nevertheless, you mm. have my deepest sympathies. My dear man, the widow's weeds Those simply aren't to my style, story, which is why I booked myself a berth on this cruise, seen this to see the sights. <laughs> well, uh, and maybe find a little room for the way. Naughty sort of woman, really. But side. clearly up for an adventure and some fun. And, uh, oh yes, I think game for anything. And loves playing one man off against the other, too. I think she's very interested in the gentleman. Sarah Bedell, I am absolutely thrilled we've got Sarah Bedell. I've been a fan of Sarah's since, oh, God, I can't remember when. This? There is a little bit oh, of a history yes. behind this. When I was in my teens, I was in the Youth Theatre, the Thornlight Theatre with Leatherhead, well, which was very active in the Theatre in those days. And oh, I actually yes. doubled for Sarah Bedell in a play it's called Night and Day by Tom Stoppard. Rough, rough. I wasn't admittedly in a blonde wig and he only saw my back, but... Um, since then, what happened was that I then auditioned for drama school and Sarah Bedell had been so fantastic in this part, I ruthlessly nicked her performance and the speeches from this play in order to get into drama school. It's a lovely sort of circular thing where I've been able to give her a job and say, do you know what? <laughs> Due to you, I think I got into drama school because she's such a supremely good actress and I don't think we see enough of her, frankly. I, I think she's terrific. And, and Perfectly fitted for this part, I have then to say. It's great fun. I think it's beautifully written. And we'll it has an absolute top. flow to it, because her, her mind runs way ahead of her. And she's got absolutely...
absolutely the end of a phrase in her, in her head and runs rings round everybody too, which, is, which I like but, doing. Uh... <laughs> She's cleverer than I am by a long shot. A woman in my circumstances is liable to attract all sorts of unwelcome escort. True. Uh... So I wondered if you might consent For to now? with me tomorrow. We will. I, I would be... Goodbye, everybody. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, Thank uh, you for I watching. I need ask a true...